It's time for another episode of Quarter of the Galaxy from the Box. The show that gets you behind the scenes of the LA Galaxy and into the minds of soccer reporters and MLS experts. Your hosts for the day are Corner of the Galaxy, Josh Gessman, LA Times soccer reporter, Kevin Baxter. Let's start the show. Hey everybody, welcome to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. I'm your host, Josh Gessman, coming to you on Monday, February 10th. The LA Galaxy get a preseason game, another preseason game under their belt. We're going to talk about that. Uh, also, uh, more updates on Chicharito, some injury updates as well as we actually get closer and closer to the start of the MLS season. Just 19 days into the LA Galaxy here at Houston, so we'll uh, we'll get that ready and, uh, and rolling for you as well. And in order to help me do all of that fun stuff is Kevin the Panda Baxter himself. Kev, how's it going, buddy? We're still going with that music, huh? Yeah. Well, I mean, listen, the way we record, I know you can't hear it anyway, so I don't want to hear it. But it's just, you know, people tune into Corner of the Galaxy and they, and they expect that theme song. They're waiting for, like, Purple Rain and they get a polka. Yeah, well, you know what? You know what they can do? They can pay me to not have to challenge every single show that we do with YouTube's copyright police. So how about, of- how about they pay me for 20 minutes every single show? Speaking of musicians, did you know that Carlos Santana had a brother? I did not know. I, this is going to be bad, but yes, I didn't know that Carlos Santana had a brother. Yeah, uh, his name was Guillermo Jorge. Oh, his name still is. Okay. Um, and he he was in that group Malo that had that hit uh, Suavecito back in the 70s. Yes. And and what does this have to do with anything? Nothing, nothing. It's just okay. a little bit of trivia that occurred to me as we're talk, talking music. Well, you know, hey, why not go off the rails within the first 30 seconds? That's what I say. Don't don't. That way people have no pretense about what this show would could possibly be about. That's uh, right. Not going to be about thanks, the ga- thank, galaxy. That's thanks for sure. listening, everybody. We'll see you next week. <laughs> uh, all right. So the LA Galaxy get a, a preseason game under their belt. This one, not closed door. Uh, the unbeaten game. Galaxy. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say 2-0 now. 2-0-0 uh, in preseason. They've scored uh, six goals, allowed two goals. So for a team. Really one. Really one. Yeah, really well, one. because the other. Because, yeah, I mean, yeah. We, we can talk Today about the good. New England yeah. one. Um, but no, for a team, just at least, you know, if we're, if we're sitting there and saying, and I talked about this on Thursday with Sophie, for a team who had two big questions of, are they going to score goals and are they going to, are the, and who's going to stop the goals? Uh, so far in preseason, they've at least been, uh, attempting to manage both of those things. And they've been doing very well and they've run a lot of people in and out of there. Remember they, they, today's game, they beat uh, a, a pretty good new England team with, with Bruce Arena on the sideline and they did it without, uh, Jonathan Dos Santos, they did it without Chicharito. Um, they ran a lot of young players in in the second half. So um, it, still questions on the back line. And, and uh, Dennis DeClosa did say after the game that he's still absolutely – we asked him if he's still pursuing uh, another center back, and we couldn't even finish the question before he answered. Absolutely, I'm still looking for one. So still some work to be done. Yeah, it seems that way. I mean, again, it, it, it seems like that way. If you look at the death chart, there's clearly a hole at center back. So – uh, that's something that we'll uh, we'll continue to watch and see how that goes. Um, you know, one of the big things that we're sort of seeing though uh, in this in this preseason is is just the the additions, right? The Alexander Katai's. Uh, you're seeing what possibly Christian Pavone is going to be able to do with a full season under his belt as well. So um, I think there's a lot of positives for the LA Galaxy. I think that right now, uh, if you're looking at it, that you have to be you know pretty excited for what the Galaxy are able to show you just in these limited amounts. And for anybody who was lucky enough to be in the L.A. area, Kevin, uh, you could actually watch this game, which is something that uh, was not true of the first, quote unquote, closed door, closed media scrimmage uh, that they had. Well, we know why that was. I mean, it's it's no secret. The Galaxy isn't even really trying to hide the fact that Chicharito played in that first game against Vancouver, even though he didn't have his visa, which technically is a violation of immigration law. He is now in Mexico, I believe Mexico City. trying to get that taken care of should be back i i understood you were telling me earlier that he could be back as early as tomorrow yeah he could actually be back on tuesday and and back training i think the worst case scenario is that he's back you know tuesday night and ready for training on wednesday but he is out of the country right now in mexico uh getting that visa paperwork taken care of and so that way he can re-enter the united states under that p1 visa we talked a lot about this where uh players have to go outside of the united states in order to then come back in uh once they've been signed with their p1 visa documentation and, and all that stuff so it looks like chicharito uh is doing that which means that unless something goes totally sideways Kevin uh, that Chicharito will be available and will be able to play on Saturday in the LA Galaxy's preseason game 
So um, all those things being equal, not a horrible thing. And, and I think even before this game started, we tweeted out he wouldn't be here for this exact reason that he's getting it all taken care of. Um, so you're just you're, you're not that far away from seeing, you know, what should be a, a pretty good offense for the L.A. Galaxy with Pavone and Chicharito and Katai sort of up on that front line. So um, that's something to look forward to. But I'll say as we look at this this New England game, uh, first of all, the the big furor before anything even started, Kevin, was the fact that this this game was geo blocked by the LA Galaxy, and and geo blocking is like geolocation blocking. Um, it's talking about if you're outside of a certain uh, area that you're not able to watch this game. And that's what happened. If you were outside of what is the normally Spectrum Sports Net area, so I think that stretches you know, up a little bit into the Central Valley, Kevin, all the way down to San Diego, uh, Inland Empire, all the way, I think, into Las Vegas even. Um, that's the normal Spectrum Sports Net ne- area. So if you were in that area, you were more than willing and able to watch this. But if you were outside the state and anywhere else, you couldn't watch this game. Now, this is not a a media rights issue um, from anything that I've been told. This is not a media rights. It wasn't like Spectrum Sportsnet was broadcasting this, and therefore they had the rights to this game and they were doing it. Uh, This is uh, the LA Galaxy blocking basically most of the world, basically, uh, and most of the United States from watching this game, except if you were in the LA area. Um, so is this is this Gio's revenge for being sold to Club America? Yeah, yeah, totally it is. Uh, yeah, it's a it's a Giovanni Dos Santos thing. Um, so so whenever I sort of asked about what was going on, you know, uh, basically was told that this is an MLS mandate, Kevin. So MLS, and I noticed it on Atlanta United stream. I've noticed it on some other preseason streams where I've gone to gone to watch other teams play, and you can't watch it because you're not in that area. And so MLS put out a mandate this off season that basically said that you're not allowed to stream games across the nation or worldwide for free. That can't happen. Um, and in, in, for me, at least, just at, you know, at the base level of looking at this, you sit there and say, that has to be, somebody has a big game plan that they're thinking of, and this has to be part of it, because otherwise it makes absolutely zero sense that you would want to limit anybody who is interested in watching MLS from watching MLS preseason. Yeah, it's not like the league's turning away fans. I mean, if anything, it needs to be creating interest, not trying to block interest. They do have a new TV deal that they have to negotiate in the next couple of years. And one of the things we've talked about on this show is how MLS has quietly told clubs, do not negotiate in-market television deals, that we're going to do everything nationally. And once that's done, then we can have some in-market stuff. Um, This is how it's done in you know, other countries around the world where uh, there are national deals, not individual club deals. A lot of that stuff goes on to the internet, but you know, other kind I mean, if, if MLS is trying to follow and I, I want to see what the model becomes because if they're trying to fo- follow models from England or Germany, these are s- much smaller countries without time zones and, and, you know, all, all kinds of regional uh, sports networks and all that. I, I don't know that these models from Europe, necessarily work in the United States. And so it'll be interesting to see what they come up with. But, you know, there could be no room for a spectrum uh, in the future that everything is going to be on some sort of a national feed or maybe maybe there'll be, uh, you know, more MLS TV channels that you watch and MLS will control all the revenue and the programming and they won't deal with uh, independent companies like Spectrum. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the hope here is that um, you find a, a, a you know a model that would allow anybody in the United States or uh, quite honestly anybody who wants to pay for this to get that information. It's probably going to be the United States because they're going to sell, sell media deals to other countries. But uh, honestly, if you want to watch an Atlanta United game, you should be able to watch one you know anywhere. And if you want to watch an LA Galaxy game and you're in Chicago, or if you want to watch an LA Galaxy game and you're in Texas or Florida or Virginia or anywhere else in the United States, you should just be able to watch it. Um, the whole idea that there are these like cut up media markets and all these other things, unless there's some media rights issue in terms of a local media rights has something and they don't want it to go to other people because the other people aren't paying for it. Like the, these are all, it's all a matter of who's paying for stuff. But if you have these things available all in one place, you know, we, we lean towards being something like ESPN plus where you would just be able to go to ESPN plus and get any game you wanted to watch at any time, including your local team or a team that you follow all the way across the country. Um, these preseason games used to be like that, which was just, hey, just log into you know LAGalaxy.com and watch it. And MLS has shut that down, saying basically if you're not within the you know geographical area of the club, you're not going to get to watch it. Now, now New England people were able to watch it because New England geo blocked it or yeah geo tagged it basically to their area. 
All right. So, uh, you know, people were like, well, I can watch it in New England. I don't know what the problem is. Yeah. Yes. Because you got geo tagged on your side. Uh, L.A. Galaxy fans got geo tagged on this side. But if you were in Texas, you didn't get to watch it. And I know there were some Galaxy fans in Texas who didn't get to watch it. Um, well, and- I mean, what this is, is they're trying to protect the product. So why give away the product for free when there's a way that we can get revenue from this? Well, they need to create a demand for the product first. And, I'm, you know, MLS is getting better. Yeah, we see attendance going up and revenue going up every year. But I'm not so sure it's to that stage where you need to start blocking uh, uh, live streams because there's a way to make money off that or because there's so much interest. There's not that interest yet, I don't think. Um, and I think that's putting the cart before the horse a little bit. Yeah, it, it certainly feels that way. Um, so we'll, we'll see how this all sort of plays out in terms of uh, what happens you know, further down the road. But I'll tell you right now, it seems very likely that MLS is just just going to say this is how it is from here on out. There's a whole bunch of stuff. You know, it, it, it was sort of uh, always a joke that the NFL, Kevin, was the no fun league. Um, and I have a feeling that there now are uh, enough former NFL like executives that have sort of been tied in with Major League Soccer for long enough that uh, they're going to try to turn MLS into the no fun league as well. Um, so there were a bunch of mandates that seemed to come out this off season that'll make it um, less entertaining probably for uh, for some fans, and I'll I'll cover those as they sort of come up and and, and go into those. But it was just just interesting. Um, the other part of this before we even really get into the uh, LA Galaxy versus New England game is I was uh, I was there on Saturday night as they opened up at Victoria Block. Um, and I, so, so Kevin, you'll like this. I talked to my wife and I'm like, Hey, I'm going to go up and I want to cover this. And basically she said, Hey, I would rather, you know, we do something as a family. I'm like, I, I think that's great. Why don't you guys come along thinking that a hundred percent, she would be like, I'm not coming. I'm not bringing the baby. That's not happening. And instead what she said was, yeah, that sounds good. Let's do that. So my wife and, uh, and Jake, my son, uh, came up with me, and so we sort of had to do a little roundabout in order to get them to go through one entrance and me to go, to go through another entrance in order to make it all work. Um, but anyway, so Jake was there, and I remember, Kevin, before I went, uh, uh, Michaela was asked me, she goes, so it's not going to be, like, too loud for Jake, right? She goes, it'll be fine, right? And I'm like, yeah, it's a it's a preseason event. It's going to be pretty chill. I go, I don't think there's going to be anything. So I was 100% wrong, and shame on me for being 100% wrong. Uh, there were tons of people there. Uh, the LA Galaxy claimed more than 9,000 people RSVP'd for this particular party. Um, the uh, Victoria Block uh, section on the north side of the stadium was was packed. Uh, it was loud. Um, it was like there was a game going on, and this was a training uh, sort of exercise. So uh, I was able to find a, a quieter place for my wife and son to sort of stand off to the side, and we got to meet a whole bunch of people, which was super awesome. But uh, a really cool, fun event that the Galaxy put together, and just a ton of people, Kevin. I mean, a lot of people for you know something. Again, this was an open training session that that sort of didn't even feature Chicharito outside of him training by himself. So um, it was uh, it was it was pretty incredible to see the turnout. There were a lot of people sitting in the, in the Victoria block uh, during Sunday's U.S. national team game, the women's game with, with Canada. I guess that was, uh, I guess the practice was kind of its real uh, debut, at least for Galaxy fans, but its competitive debut, its first real uh, competitive game, I guess was Canada U.S., right? I, I mean, so the deal was they actually got some of the U.S. supporters not to sit in those sections. So the the actual supporter sections of those areas, uh, at least for the first part of that, I think it was the uh, the game before that. was There was a Friday game, right? Yeah, Friday the first game was Costa Rica and Canada, and then the U.S. played Mexico yeah. in the second game. And there were a couple of people there, but not a lot, because I remember th- there were some errant shots that sort of bounced around a lot of empty seats for a while. Yeah, yeah, and so what happened on that on the Friday was uh, the that uh, I think they actually asked the U.S. supporters groups to move sections so that way they wouldn't be the first ones in the in the supporters section, which I thought was kind of cool. So Galaxy fans actually got to christen it at at the Victoria Block Party. They got to do it, and then the next day you had uh, you had Canada and the U.S. as well. So um, yeah. I think it's cool. I think it's going to be a great addition. It seems like, again, uh, way louder than I thought it was ever going to be um, for a preseason event. A lot of fun. Uh, a bunch of people uh, saying hi. A bunch of people yelling at, at Larry Morgan, of course, uh, uh, to their Kevin, saying uh, Larry Morgan not on Twitter all over the place. So uh, it was kind of fun. Fun to see people and, uh, and very good. All right. Um, I just wanted to touch on that. I almost forgot about uh, talking about that. It seems like it was well, forever ago. And segueing back to the, to the scrimmage today or the exhibition game, whatever you want to call it, the friendly a um, couple of things I noticed. I talked to Jonathan Dos Santos after the game. He was out there in uh, in sandals, didn't even have his boots on. He had a Galaxy track suit on and said that he's not going to be, be ready to play Saturday. Um, he's pointing toward Houston, which is the regular season opener. But I have to say, he didn't sound 100% optimistic. It wasn't, I'm absolutely going to be there. 
but it was more like I'm pointing to that. I'm hopeful. Um, that's the target. I think I can go. So I, I would say he's day to day right now as far as Houston goes. I, I, I don't think that's a sure thing by any stretch of the imagination. And, you know, the Galaxy, if he's not 100 percent, if he's 85 percent, 90 percent, 95 percent, I'd probably hold him out of that game. I mean, why why risk uh, an injury like this that's going to linger, you know, for 34 games? Why why put him in that first game when, you know, you've got a whole season to go? The other thing was Ralph Felcher. I saw him coming out the field. He was covered in more ice than the Titanic. He had <laughs> ice wrapped around one ankle and both legs. He played, uh, and he played well in the game, but uh, I'm, and that may be something that is, uh, that they do after every game. You know, we can't go, as you know, we can't go into the, into the training facilities where the doctors work on players. We don't know who gets ice and who gets what we do see it, uh, in a game like this, where they're out in the open uh, on the track stadium field, and he walked off with uh, ice tape to a lot of uh, his extremities. That may be something normal because he did play, but it it, it caught my attention. He was uh, he was really wrapped up like a mummy when he came out the field. Yeah, I mean uh, that's certainly do we don't so we've been assuming Kevin that there was something uh, with Jonathan Dos Santos. I think that Larry and I had talked, and he said it looked like possibly possibly a groin issue. Um, but we don't have a, a diagnosis diagnosis on Jonathan Dos Santos, right? No, we don't. But we do know his English is really good now. Yeah, it's starting to. It's it. He's really not going to be able to hide from us this this uh, this season, yeah. where he's really going to have to talk to us in English because he does such a good job and uh, he seems to be doing a lot better. But anyway, yeah, the the injury. I think we're leaning towards groin right now, but that's far from confirmed. So don't sit there and jump up and down and say, "Oh, it's definitely a groin injury." But if it was, it would be something that you would want to see him. Uh, like you said, a nagging injury like a groin is something you do not want to push. Uh, and the game against Houston, we you know talked a little bit about it on Thursday night whenever we heard that there was, and Jonathan took a picture of himself basically at a hospital where uh, we were able to confirm on Friday that he was just getting some tests uh, done. Uh, whether or not that means anything or not, who knows? I mean, a lot of times we don't get the full story on this stuff, but Jonathan was there uh, getting tests done on this injury that had been nagging him. Um, so that was something that we sort of kept an eye on. And we talked about if there was one place the LA Galaxy probably had some room to to get some stuff or, or to have some other players in there, Kevin. It was it was there. It was at the central midfield where you have guys like Perry Kitchen, which, by the way, I don't think we saw Perry Kitchen play at all in this preseason scrimmage, and we'll talk a little bit about that, so that's another question mark. But you have uh, Perry uh, Perry Kitchen uh, and Sasha Kleshin, Sebastian Legette, and Joe Corona, and you can all rotate those guys into a, a bunch of different things. There's a huge drop-off between everybody else and Jonathan Dos Santos, but you're not in panic mode um, as you would be if, say, a center back went down right now. Yeah, the Galaxy have something like 611 midfielders, so it is a position of strength for them. But, you know, with, with the injuries, and I know there's always nagging injuries this time of the year, but one thing I'm going to watch really closely, especially early in the year, is, is these kind of muscle injuries, fatigue injuries. Um, and, and it, it makes me wonder whether this the, the whole Val de Cantos program is really um, – what the galaxy want to go with going forward. I mean, I know it worked in Argentina and there's, you can talk about a million different ways from the climate to the type of players, but I'm just wondering if, if, if this intense preseason program uh, in a short period of time, the two a days, you know, after the game today, everybody was out running uh, for 45 minutes after the game. Uh, I'm just wondering whether it might be a little bit too much. It doesn't seem to be paying the benefits when you look at what happened with with Roman last year, and then now Jonathan Dos Santos with the nagging muscle injuries already, whether uh, Perry Kitchen, another one. I'm just wondering if this is really the best thing, the best fit for the Galaxy. Uh, the Galaxy lined up uh, with the starters of David Bingham at goal, Rolf Felcher at right back, uh, Daniel Starez, um, People Gonzalez, and then Danilo Acosta on the back line. You had Sasha Kleschen, Joe Corona, Sebastian Legette. Uh, you had Katai, uh, Alexander Katai, you had Christian Pavone, and you had Ethan Zubak standing in for Chicharito. So those were the quote-unquote starters. Uh, the starters that you're missing here are Jonathan Dos Santos, as we talked about, uh, Emiliano Insua as well, and he didn't play at all in any of this. I was asked if there was any injury there. I was told there wasn't, and it seemed like he was he was there. He was just on the sidelines in terms of they, maybe they're sort of bringing him on a little bit slowly. He just got in last week, and so uh, bringing him you know, quickly into the squad, maybe not the best idea. So they're sort of going to start feathering him in probably. I would expect that if he's fine and if this holds up, that you'll go and you'll see him play on Saturday because that left back role really is his. Um, although I thought Acosta played just fine. 
Um, the the big question mark has been Kevin. Uh, you know, really the the defense. Uh, you saw what the LA Galaxy were able to do with Katai uh, and Pavone, and you understand what Chicharito will be there as well. Um, you know, all of these things seem to sort of lead our lead everyone to the fact that the offense should be okay. Um, and we'll talk about all that stuff as well. Um, but for in this preseason game. Um, you know, the defense was, I would say, if New England hadn't just gotten to Southern California and just was really stretching their legs, I feel like their uh, their finishing would have been much better and this score wouldn't have been 2-1, even though the one goal they scored was probably offside. Um, they had some chances that they definitely uh, didn't didn't take a real good look at. But uh, I made a bunch of notes, and I, I'm sure if you follow me on Twitter, you saw some of them. Uh, I'll just go over some of those notes for this game. Uh, because I think they're important to sort of, you know, we have to take a, a, a holistic approach at this um, or or a a very wide approach on this. You can't go in and just focus on details because the preseason, Kevin, that those details don't probably don't mean anything. Um, and so we look at the starters and say, OK, 60 minutes of starters. What did we what did we sort of like? I, I love the fact that it seems like there was some great quick passing. We talked about Tiki Taco. Uh, you know, football that has been played by the LA Galaxy probably in, you know, 2014 and 2012. Um, some of those 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 years where they were able to dominate possession and pass around people and create things from that passing. Um, you know, there were some signs of that between, you know, Sebastian Legette and Katai and sort of the overlaps between Katai and Pavone. And I think the most interesting thing you saw in this scrimmage was not only that Katai and Pavone and Zubak were able to get forward so quickly as the in the positions that they were able to do it, which meant that sometimes Pavone and Katai were attacking with each other um, on the same side even and had overlapping runs on the same side, um, which is funny because they technically play on opposite sides of the field. So you could see there's going to be and there should be a ton of interchangeability. Um, I'm going to be honest, Kevin, uh, watching Katai play, I thought I was watching Roman Alessandrini sometimes. Uh, they are very similar players in the way that they sort of uh, attack. Uh, Alexander Katai seems to have a, re- a great work ethic, uh, works really hard. He has technical ability. I would probably lean more towards Alessandrini in terms of the technical ability. But uh, Katai is no slouch. He was a- easily on the same page with Christian Pavone. Uh, which is, in my mind, you know, sort of a next level sort of uh, players. Whenever you look at, you know, who's who's going to be combining with each other's and and the game minds that are with all of those guys. So for me, uh, Pavone Katai were excellent, and and Zubak got a goal because he was in the right place and a great cross by Pavone. Pavone had a goal and an assist in this game. So. Um, the 60 minutes, I think you say the offense was good. I thought Sebastian Legette was good. Uh, it's just the defensive side of things. And again, you know, people Gonzalez is a question mark. Having uh, Danny Acosta back there at left back is a question mark. Rolf Felcher at right back is a question mark. Uh, even whenever Rolf switched over and played a little left back, that was a question mark as well. Um, the only player to go 90 minutes in all of this was Joe Corona, uh, who got uh, at one point was leveled and was down on the field for a little while and seemed to bounce back up. And Julian Araujo played some good second half minutes. Um, in the second 45, uh, he was my big sort of takeaway for the second 45. I thought Julian Araujo is playing at that quote-unquote international speed, Kevin. Uh, you know, the the speed that guys get whenever they've been away to national team camp and everything plays a little bit faster. Uh, he seemed to be on that level in terms of thinking faster than everybody else. So uh, it was good to see that step forward. A couple of impressions for me. I, I don't know that I've seen much from Ephraim Alvarez this this winter. No. Um, you know, he was kind of the flavor of the month for the longest time, and he, he did get a chance. Fitness has always been his problem. Um, uh, you know, I joked with a couple people from other teams uh, and, and even, uh, you know, from national teams about his talent. And then I, I just mentioned, but he doesn't see, ever seem to be fit enough to go, uh, you know, more than 60 minutes. And, and there was a lot of knowing nods. And so I think that's kind of the MO that's getting around on him is that he's just certainly not, he's not taking care of himself. He's not taking care of his body. He's not eating right. And he's not fit enough to, to, to do anything, but come off the bench. And he doesn't seem to be uh, providing that. Sp- I mean, he's got a world of talent and he, he's going to be one of those guys that are just going to make unbelievable plays, but whether he becomes that real force that we've all expected him to be, that seems to be lacking right now. And then the other thing you talk about the defense and, you know, as we said, Dennis is still, Dennis, the close is still looking for at center back. He hasn't given up yet. Um, and uh, I talked to Daniel Starris afterwards. If you remember in 2018, the galaxy gave up a ton of goals. And so coming into 2019 uh, with Guillermo as the coach, I asked him, 
and and Dave Romney, who was still there at the time, I said, how do you fix that? And they said, we feel really good this year because under GBS, we have an idea. We know what we're supposed to do. There's a game plan. And from that game plan, you can sort of call an audible and, and change things on the fly. And everybody knows what we're supposed to do and who we're supposed to back up. Well, it didn't work out as well as they all had thought because the Galaxy gave up 59 goals last season. That's a ton of goals as well. So I asked Daniel Sturris about that today. I said, hey, you know what? Two years ago, you gave up a ton of goals. You said GBS was going to fix it. You had a game plan. What's the what's the feeling going into this season? And he wasn't nearly as praiseworthy as he was as full of praise as he was last year. His deal was more like, you know, there is a game plan. You just have to trust them. You you just have to trust the coaching staff. Do what they say and believe in them and believe it's going to work out. That didn't sound like a real stamp of approval that I was kind of hoping I'd get from him, but it it, it does kind of show that, yeah, even the players are a little bit concerned about this. He did say he thinks that, you know, with a full season playing next to people, with uh, Rolf Felcher back again, really there's only one spot, which would be the left back where they're bringing in somebody new and they're bringing in a very quality player in Insua. So I, I, I feel like the players themselves are a little bit apprehensive, a little bit wary, um, but they all believe that the, the idea of one season together, coming back for a second season and a full training camp remember Giancarlo wasn't here for the full training camp last year either that a full training camp together and then uh, coming off a full season that they're going to be on the same page much more often this year yeah I mean I think they have to be uh you know one of the things that you just you keep seeing in these games and and certainly listen the second half of these this game you know I saw a lot of people complaining about the quality of play and how much you know the galaxy dropped off after the starters went out it's like yeah that's what happens because the team you're seeing come onto the field after um, them after the starters come on is not a team, Kevin. You know those are those are guys who come in and fill in uh, in spots for the other guys, but really they're not used to playing with each other any more than um, you know they would be playing with anybody else. Where you're you're just sort of thrown together because that's what happens. Really, they're pieces that get plugged in. So what you need to look at in that second half when you're looking at guys like Efrain Alvarez, when you're looking at guys like Didi Traore. Um, you know, there's a uh, the uh, the uh, very talented, and I would say my biggest takeaway from the second half was uh, Kai Korniak. Uh, he seems like he is going to get signed to the LA Galaxy senior team. Uh, that seems almost a foregone conclusion. He has the size, he has the pace, um, he has the physicality. Uh, I think if he just uh, gets a little bit uh, better on his settling, he probably has a goal in that second half for the Galaxy. But he seems like he's a physical player that can play at the MLS level. So. Um, you have to look at the individual performances in that second half, not as a team performance, because you're just not going to get it. I, I mean, you know, you want to talk about a great individual performance in the second half, uh, whenever they, after the 60th minute, Didi Traore was put on, um, I think, Teal Bunbury of New England, and Traore locked him out at a center back position. Um, Traore was playing at the center back position um, and locked Bunbury out, and granted, you know, the the Granted, the the people around Bunbury maybe weren't the best, and again, same with New England. It's like they had a line change as well, so they're not as good as what you saw um, from you know the uh, from in, in that second half with all of the subs. But at the same time, you want to see those types of performances. You want to see. Um, those individual performances that get you to a place where you can try to make a decision on somebody. Uh, You're not going to see great team play. It's going to be choppy. I I wrote that it had the frantic... Uh, sort of feeling of any USL game, which uh, which seems to sort of be it's a you know it's a foot race back and forth and back and forth. Um, so it's not going to be pretty. But what you see in that second half is guys like Julian Araujo sort of standing out against everybody. You know, Cornea standing out against everybody. Um, Traore possibly standing out against everybody. So those are the things that you want to keep watching um, as you go into these preseason games, and that goes for whenever the Galaxy play on Saturday. Uh, you know, against the Chicago Fire, you're going to want to watch that and say okay, whenever they bring the starters out, maybe it's at the 70th minute this time instead of the 60th minute. Uh, Maybe Guillermo actually runs people almost the full 90 minutes. I don't think that's going to happen. But you have to keep all these things in mind that whenever they pull the subs out, that you're you're sort of like, okay, this is not a team anymore. Where are the individuals and how are these individuals performing? Are they in the proper position, in the proper place? Um, You know, I thought, again, just the standouts on this, um, you know, in that second half were guys who I think – 
you could possibly see on that senior team. And we talk a lot about Triori dropping back down to LA Galaxy 2 because of the international slot. That's still maybe the case. Um, but right now you're seeing that he's trying to make, you know, a little bit of a statement saying I belong to 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 be on the senior team. Uh, and he's certainly trying. I mean, Ethan Zubak has been making it now his mission uh, to be on the senior team and to be, he is on the senior team, but to be that backup for Chicharito, we're talking about the LA Galaxy being short on forwards, Kevin, uh, short on attackers underneath Chicharito. If Chicharito gets, you know, God forbid, gets a knock, an injury, where are the LA Galaxy going to go? And so far, Ethan Zubak has two goals. Um, you know, and it's and if you're a striker, there's nothing better that you can say than I have two goals in the preseason right now. Um, well, um- there's another thing too, when you if you're complaining about the rough play, and you're going to see some more on Saturday. Um, there's another thing going on. You have to look at what are the Galaxy trying to accomplish. Yes, when they run the starters out there and that lineup that they used, I think is the starting lineup with the exception of Jonathan and, and Chicharito being out. But when, especially when you see some of those subs running on, what are the Galaxy trying to do after they've gotten their first team guys minutes together to build some of that chemistry, and they they bring in guys like uh, uh, Jonathan Perez or Cameron Dunbar. One of the things they're trying to do is give those academy kids some first team minutes to show them and to show everybody at the academy that, look, if you play well and you perform well, you're going to get a look. We're going to take a look at you. And that's really important to those kids um, to know that that they're not being ignored. And that had been a problem with the Galaxy in the past. It was very difficult to get from the academy to the USL team and then to the first team. Very few people came up, and that's why we talk so much about Steris and, and Romney and, uh, and guys like that that have, uh, you know, Alvarez that have made that transition because it doesn't happen very often. And I talked to one of the people at the academy today, Sasha Vandermost, and he talked exactly about that. He said that's exactly why we're doing that, so that these kids have the belief that they're going to get a shot. Now it's up to them what they do with it, um, uh, you know, if, if they impress or not. But getting some of these minutes now and then maybe getting some in maybe a U.S. Open Cup game or somewhere else, it's really important that they know that if they come to the Galaxy Academy that there is a pathway from the academy to the first team. Otherwise, why do it? Why not go somewhere? Why not go to college if you're just going to be wasting your time here? So that was important. And by the way, talking about Sasha Vandermost, he is, if you don't know the name, he's very uh, a very important guy. He was one of the, the builders of that great Chivas USA Academy that had so many great players like you know, Yuli Yanez came through there. Efren Alvarez came through there. A lot of great uh, players who have gone on to do a lot of things. It was one of the greatest, probably, academies affiliated with any MLS team. And he was one of the architects, along with Dennis DeClosa, of that academy. Dennis hired him in August to work with the Galaxy Academy and h- help to rebuild that. Now, Sasha is uh, totally plugged in, especially with the Latino community in the U.S. and Southern California. He worked with Alianza and a lot of other groups. Anyway, I tell you all this to tell you that after six months with the Galaxy Academy, he is now leaving the Galaxy. He's going to go uh, help start a company that's going to work with sports tour, sort of sports travel, sports tourism, organizing tournaments around the world, and then taking youth teams to play in those tournaments. Um, it, it's one of those things where it, you know it, it's it, you really don't see it as way, way under the radar. It's very inside baseball, off in the weeds, whatever uh, it, terms you want to use. But he was a real important part in rebuilding this academy, and uh, I think the Galaxy will be okay without him, but uh, he's going to be a hard guy to replace. Yeah, it, it seems that way. Uh, again, like you said, this is a guy that Dennis DeClosa sort of put in charge of you know, re- rebuilding the LA Galaxy Academy. Um, and doing that. And so, you know, having an academy position like that, the director of the academy uh, position open like that, again, is again, it's another thing that the LA Galaxy have to fill. It's another thing they're going to have to do um, in order to, uh, to you know, continue to build on these foundations that they have. And I think, you know, you look at it and there are some guys who are coming up that the LA Galaxy could totally hit on if they if they're they're doing the correct thing. I mean, you know, we've been hearing about Cameron Dunbar possibly signing a homegrown uh, player uh, contract, so that's a possibility there. Um, you know, we talked about uh, Kai Korniak. Uh, uh, Kor- I cannot say his name. I will eventually get it. But anyway, um, Kai Korniak. I'm turning into you, Kevin. I can't say players' names all of a sudden. Um, so, but you know, that could be something, uh, you talked about, you know, the LA galaxy, uh, signing, you know, Nick deploy. Um, that's also again, LA galaxy two up to, you know, that thing. And so the galaxy Academy can fill LA galaxy two and LA galaxy two can then fill the, the senior team. And, and I think that's how Dennis is looking to build this team is back filled with a lot of these Academy and LA galaxy two guys. And whenever you have the director who's now leaving, so any of the progress that you made over the last, you know, what is it year or, um, since Dennis really 
really came in, um, you know, kind of goes by the wayside a little bit, or at least you have to hit pause on it. Um, so that's a, that could be a, it, it turns out it could be something huge, uh, and could have great effect on the LA galaxy, both positively or negatively, uh, whenever you go down the, well, down the line on it. Well, one thing Dennis is doing is he is bringing a U- European model and European vision to this and, and, and Mexico where Dennis worked for, uh, you know, a couple decades, um, it has been similar. And I, I think of the example of Sevilla, the club that Chicharito came from, because I talked to a lot of the front office people in Sevilla, this winter and they try to explain their system and you know people look at it and say well the academy system hasn't produced a first team player or they produced one or whatever we're spending all this money the way Sevilla uses it is really the model is first of all they they believe if you produce your own player it's much cheaper than going out and paying a, a tremendous transfer fee and they're absolutely right in that it's much cheaper to do that but it's not so much who gets to the first team it's if you have an academy player that doesn't fit into your model and isn't going to make your first team Barcelona does this too then you take that guy and you sell that guy and you get a transfer fee for that guy. And then the money you get from that, then you you want to sell two or three of these guys and in one transfer window, then you have enough to go out and pay for a big name player. So the, what, what these people really are, the academy are assets. And if you have people like Sasha Vandermos that can find these academy kids, bring them in, turn them either into first team players or to players that are assets that you can sell to go out and get other players. I mean, it, it all works the same way. It all builds your first team roster, whether those guys the academy players are the ones that do it or whether they're sold to make money, uh, you know, to fund some of these transfers. And another thing, if, if you have somebody really paying attention to what's going on in the academy, like Dennis is doing now, you don't lose someone like a Yuliana doesn't wind up playing for Wolfberg at 19 or 18. Um, you keep those guys in house. And, and that's another, I think another way to measure this is, is how many people now flee. Uh, you know, we had that big exodus in 2018, we haven't seen that since then. Right. Yeah. I mean, everything stayed pretty much uh, the same. So, again, uh, it's going to be interesting to see. Uh, the Galaxy get the 2-1 win in this scrimmage. Um, it was, I think, a, a good test for the LA Galaxy in terms of, you know, they got some actual minutes. I think that seeing the starters, quote-unquote starters, Kevin, go 60 minutes is good. Um, I'm trying to think of, you know, really it, the the biggest deal here to me is how quick the LA Galaxy are going to be on the counterattack this year. Um, with Christian Pavone, uh, with Alexander Katai, with Chicharito. Uh, this seems like it's going to be uh, a lot of offense. And then you wonder how that offense is going to translate into uh, the team defense that everybody talks about them needing to play. Um, so just, I, I don't know, it, it feels like there's a lot of questions um, still to be answered in this preseason, which is probably fine. There's, you know, you're two games in, you still have two big games, and I think another closed-door scrimmage uh, also coming next week as well. Um, so you still have some time to figure this stuff out. But, I mean, again, we're, we're not exactly, like, real far away from things. 19 days until the LA Galaxy travel to Houston, uh, 26 days until the LA Galaxy have their home opener versus the Vancouver Whitecaps, uh, just 85 days right now left in the primary transfer window. So still some time to add pieces and do that stuff. But I don't think if you're dead Dennis, you want to still be building a team right now um, whenever the season starts. I think that, you know, Dennis really would probably like to have this figured out before that first uh, first kick. Well, yeah, but he's also being very patient. I mean, I think one thing most general managers will tell you is the worst signing is signing the guy you don't need, you know, panicking. Um, it, you, you know, even Dennis has said, I'd rather wait to the summer to get the guy I really want than to sign somebody now and, and spend that money and take up that roster spot. So that's a difficult balance. You say, well, you know, it, this guy's really, if this guy's really a difference maker, can he get us to the playoffs in the second half of the season? Is that all he needs? Um, so, you know, it's tough. I mean, I don't know who he's looking at. There are some guys that, that we definitely know that they were involved with, and Dennis decided to take a pass for a number of different reasons. They're a, a bad fit that the other team was asking for too much money. Um, it, it, you know, it didn't feel right. It, you know, it wasn't a, a, one of those gut feelings didn't work for him. So, um, at this moment, you know, that's the guy with the experience. I'm going to trust him, but he knows he needs somebody and he knows he, the season starts in 19 days. So, um, obviously he's, he's got a thought process that said now's not the right time or, or this player is not the right one. Yeah, I, I, that certainly, be the ca- uh, certainly seems to be the case. Um, what we have right now on the preseason roster is we did get an additional player, so I'm now showing 30 players 
on the roster, the preseason roster. This is not the official LA Galaxy roster. This is not the senior team roster. This is the preseason roster. Uh, thanks to some eagle-eyed listeners who shot me some photos of a particular player, we were able to find out that a uh, a 24-year-old forward, Gordon Wild, was on trial with the LA Galaxy. Uh, Wild was out of contract after the 2019 season, um, and that 2019 season, uh, he was with DC United, but although he was never really with DC United, and before that, he was with Atlanta United, although he was never really with Atlanta United, both times that was with the USL sides um, of those teams. So um, that's what you're seeing right now. A guy who has zero MLS minutes, uh, played at the University of Maryland, uh, is a forward, is currently out there and on trial with the LA Galaxy, and you saw him in the second half uh, play a little bit with the LA Galaxy and be that forward up top in front of Efrain Alvarez and some of the others um, sort of trying to lead out the attacks on that. Um, I would say that as a whole, I wouldn't consider this, uh, you know, a make or break uh, for the LA Galaxy. I think for Gordon Wilde, it could be make or break. Um, but a guy who is uh, originally from Germany, uh, currently on trial with the LA Galaxy, Gordon Wilde. Num- uh, let's see, they didn't, the Galaxy haven't been wearing numbers yet, so I can't even tell you what number he is. Um, but he's been uh, out there as a trialist with the Galaxy. The Galaxy, by the way, have only three forwards on the roster right now. The preseason roster, uh, Chicharito, they have uh, Zubek, um, well, actually four, Zubek, Cameron Dunbar, and then uh, Mohamed Kamara, who is from Liberia and UCLA. The last two are really uh, USL guys. So Gordon Wilde does have a chance. As you said, he did play at the University of Maryland. Interesting backstory with him, though. He, he comes from uh, his father, is, his mother is German, his father is Danish. The family tradition going back, it goes back to the 19th century. He comes from a family of acrobats. Um, his mom and dad, they were a duo that uh, traveled around Europe um, uh, before they created their own circus company. And Wilde has a half brother who entertained on Royal Caribbean cruises for a dozen years. His great grandmother, grandmother, not grandfather, she walked a tightrope over a lion's cage. So um, as he once said in, in an interview, he said, I'm not from a normal family. He said, it's really cool and I'm 100% proud of it. But that's the kind of he's not going to be he's not going to be too frightened to take a penalty kick if he needs to after watching his great grandmother walk over a lion's cage. That is, uh, you know, as always, Kevin, the little tidbits that you're able to find. Uh, it's just oh. it, it sort of shocks everybody. The wild side. The wild side. Yeah, I know. Somebody was saying, "Hey, if you tie, if, you know, if you you sign somebody like Tom Smart, who was the LA Galaxy's draft pick, uh, you somebody it's somebody like Gordon Wild, you have Wild and Smart, and you know the 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 jokes can start writing themselves. Uh, the awesomeness can start writing themselves. I, I remember at one point I was keeping track of how many um, Galaxy players had the last name that started with A because there were a whole bunch. Uh, and so now I think we're just going to go with some of those fun names like Gordon Wilde or uh, perhaps Tom Smart or uh, or any of the other fun ones that you can sort of put together out there. So, uh, you know, he won, by the way, Gordon Wilde, he played before he went to Maryland. He played at a lower tier Division One school in South Carolina. I, I, the name of the school escapes me right now, but he won a national scoring title. That was in 2015. So he knows how to he knows how to play, he knows how to score. Um, he just hasn't been able to obviously, obviously translate that to uh the mls level at this point yeah he scored 22 goals uh for the university of maryland largely considered one of the best soccer programs in the united states uh at the collegiate level uh 22 goals uh earned a spot on the preseason mac herman trophy watch list big 10 conference offensive player of the year first team all big 10 and the big 10 tournament's most valuable offensive player i mean there's you know you get all the stats that sort of fall into that with this guy uh however uh, let's see, Atlanta, DC United, now the, now a trial with the LA Galaxy, uh, yet yet to see any MLS minutes, and maybe there's a reason for that. Um, certainly you can say that some guys just, there's a bigger jump now between college and the pro level than there has ever been, and you're sort of seeing the effect of that on the Major League Soccer draft. The Super Draft is basically, you know, sort of dying uh, slowly. Uh, well, especially goal scorers. I've been told by a number of MLS executives that, when they draft American players, they want goalies, they want holding midfielders, they want defenders, first of all, because they take up less salary. The American players seem to be the lower salary uh, people on rosters. But American defenders, by and large, seem to be able to hold their own. And you and when you're going to spend a ton of money, you're going to go out and get a scorer. And, and you know, U.S. college players coming out uh, of college, going to the pros as, as attackers, um, 
they, they don't seem to get the attention. They don't seem to have the talent, the skill, whatever you want to call it. They don't seem to get the chance either, to, to be honest. So that's a, probably another thing that even though he is European, I mean, he went to school in the United States, came out of the draft in the United States. So that's another thing that's working against Wild. By the way, the Galaxy have one other potential forward. Yes. Um, Nick Dupoy. Oh, it yeah. was a forward in college and uh, a high scoring forward at that. And the galaxy I'm on the roster as a center back uh, is a big guy, six, five, 205 pounds, um, the heaviest guy on the roster by far. Um, but that's a guy I suppose they could put in uh, up front. He certainly knows what to do when he gets up there. Yeah, no, we were talking about that on uh, on Thursday uh, night with Sophie as well. We were saying, yeah, you know, he, he kind of is. So that was sort of uh, the joke, but it's also not a joke. I mean, he really can play up there, and you would think that, like, in a set-piece um, sort of condition, um, you know, that he's going to be a target if he's on the field. Uh, you know, I also think that, the, that it's wide open for him right now, Kevin, whenever you think about it. Um, it's wide open for him if he wants to, you know, make a spot and, and grab a spot as a center back and a starting center back on this team, on the senior team, it's there for him because I don't think that people Gonzalez has anything nailed down right now. And I say that, you know, with fairly fair confidence that Daniel Starez is going to be either uh, better than or the same player he was last year. Uh, people Gonzalez is really the one under the gun here. And with Dennis DeClosa pro- probably still going out trying to get another center back, um, you know, he's the one who's going to be under the most pressure. So uh, the Galaxy still need to get that center back. And it, why not be Nick DePoy or, or why doesn't it, it, you know, or it could be Didi Traore if he steps up. So how many MLS minutes does Nick DePoy have right now? Uh, let's see. He, he played in the league's cup. I think that's his only MLS minutes. Uh, he played against Cruz Azul. I think he went all 90 minutes against Cruz Azul, um, in the league's cup last year. Well, I asked that because there's history for this, for this, this route that he may be taking in, in 2016, Daniel Starris came into the season, having never played an MLS minute. Um, he, that year he played in 31 games, started 29, led the Galaxy in minutes, played 2,656 minutes, and that was a team that went to the conference final. So Nick DePoy, um, you know, there is a – was it the conference final or conference semifinals? Anyway, they lost to Colorado. But so Nick DePoy, there is a route that he can take. It's been done before, and it's been done as a center back. So, you know, you talk about the possibility of him – uh, you know, stealing a starting spot. Hey, it's happened before. Yeah, let, let me let me clear that up. Uh, he did play for Montreal. He has five games played, but a total of 128 minutes. So he's uh, 128 minutes ahead of Daniel Starris already. Already. So yeah. So he did uh, he did do that, and now he's with uh, the LA Galaxy and signed <laughs> to that first team. And you hear so many players say that, and it's so hard to take advantage of that. You know, just give me an opportunity. If I have an opportunity, that's all I ask for. Daniel Starris sees that opportunity. It, you know, it's there for Nick now. But but again, it's so many things have to break right. Um, but I, again, you know, the fact the opportunity is there. He's going to get a chance. The, the Galaxy are somewhat desperate, especially if if uh, Dennis, for whatever reason, decides to wait until the summer to fill that uh, extra center back role. He's going to need someone to get him through the first 17 or 18 games of the season. Um, Steris did it a couple years ago. DePoy could do it this year. Yeah, absolutely could. Uh, LA Galaxy coming up on their preseason uh, roster, or excuse me, their preseason schedule. Um, they have the doubleheader coming up on Saturday, February 15th. Uh, the Chicago Fire versus the Colorado Rapids kick off at 12 p.m. Then the LA Galaxy play against Toronto FC at 3 p.m. And I believe that game is going to be televised on Spectrum Sportsnet. So just... Hang in there with that. I'm not 100% sure, but we're trying to figure that all that stuff out as we get closer. I'll definitely know the answers to all that. Geo-tracking. Uh, yeah, yeah, the geo-blocking, I'm, I'm sure. Well, it seems like it might actually be on TV, which would be interesting. So anybody, uh, see everybody out there. Um, I, I Listen, if you're going to this game, why not show up to both games? Uh, for live soccer's fun. Even if it's Chicago versus Colorado Rapids, you could do some scouting on that. I think earlier I said the Galaxy were playing against Chicago on the 15th, and they're not. They're playing against Chicago on the 22nd, um, and that's the next day. Another doubleheader, Toronto FC versus the Colorado Rapids, uh, a 12 p.m. kickoff for them, and then a 3 p.m. kickoff for the LA Galaxy versus the Chicago Fire. Um, so that's where uh, the Galaxy will uh, play the Fire on that day. And, of course, that day is our live show, 2.22 at 2 p.m. Uh, on the concourse. And as I go to the stadium, Stadium on Saturday, we should be able to finalize that spot, and I'll tell you exactly on the concourse where we're going to be, and have you know a short little 55-minute live show for you, sort of in between the two games there, so that way you can still go watch the LA Galaxy versus Chicago Fire in their very last 
game before they get ready for the regular season and travel to Houston uh, to take on the Dynamo for the season opener for them. So uh, all these things coming quickly to a head, Kevin. Uh, it seems like this is going to be a frantic last couple of weeks. Uh, a lot of games being played, uh, some trips up to Dignity Health Sports Park, um, just trying to get the roster finalized, trying to see who's going to be healthy and back into these things. Um, I have a feeling that there will be more casualties on this roster before uh, the start of the season, and you should get some definitives on some health issues in terms of Jonathan Dos Santos and figure out exactly you know when he's going to be available. And like you said, it seems like it's uh, certainly a coin toss-up. I know uh, Larry was telling me whenever you guys talked to him today that uh, that Jonathan said that you know he felt pretty confident that he would be back by Houston, but at the same time there was certainly an air of qu- of question mark in that. Um, so. Yeah, and I like I liked your idea that you talked about on social media of of, of so many teams now are coming to Southern California uh, during the winter. And I talked to Bruce Arena about this, and I said, "Did you plan to come home? You know, was that already planned by the team when you took the job last year? Because remember, it was in May, and and they right. probably talked about what they wanted to do in the winter. But by then, was that your plan? He said, "No. Look, we we can't train in New England in the winter. We have to go somewhere. He said, "There's only a few places you can go. You go to Florida. You can go to Arizona. You can go to California." And he said California was the best place, and they came here, and then they're going to go to Portland uh, next week. But, you know, I think you were talking about how Dignity Health Sports Park now uh, be something like eight or nine teams that are going to – Seattle played here. There are going to be a number of teams that play here this winter. It's the perfect location. Look how many fields are there. You have the stadium, this idea of the double headers, you know, and maybe you charge admission and, and you you get a little bit of money back to help defray from some cost. But it just seems natural. And I'm not talking about setting up a tournament like they used to do in Tucson. Right. But the idea of having everybody together, I mean, it happens in baseball spring training all the time. Some of these sites in Arizona were like the White Sox and the Dodgers are together. Um it happens a lot where uh, one team will say, hey, we need to get this pitcher some extra innings or we need to get these guys some extra at-bats, and they'll just throw together a back squad game of minor leaguers. I mean, why, why could that not, uh, synergy also not happen with, say, Guillermo wants to get uh, some academy guys some some minutes in Colorado is, is the training on the next field. Why not say, hey, you guys want to play a game? Yeah. Uh, uh, it just seems to make a lot of sense. If they're going to go somewhere anyway, anyways, why not have everybody sort of, or at least a number of teams, go to the same place, train together, and, um, you know, I guess there's a little bit of uh, worry about, are you scouting, are you watching what we're doing? Uh, there's a way to work around that, but having everybody together from a training and, and game, per, uh, you know, uh, purposes of games and those kind of things makes a lot of sense. I, li- I kind of liked your proposal. I'd like to see that codified a little bit and, and made official. Yeah, I mean, I think you could probably even split it up if you wanted to. You could take the East Coast teams and, you know, send them to Florida, and you could take sort of the West Coast and send them to, uh, you know, Southern California, but there's more than enough soccer fields in the L.A. area to be able to host some of these games. And listen, um, it would be kind of cool if, let's say, you could buy a ticket for like 10 bucks, Kevin, and that would allow you to walk around to, you know, the different fields that are sort of around and watch like a scrimmage. Like, on Saturdays, all the teams are scrimmaging, you know, and so you can go watch whatever team you sort of want to watch you can sort of walk around i i once uh i've been to wimbledon or fortunate enough the like the three times i've been in london two of those times were in july and they were over when wimbledon was there and you can actually buy a a ticket to the to the stadium grounds right and those stadium grounds basically give you access to all of the outside courts you don't get the stadium court you don't get the main court but you get all the outside courts and if you go early enough in the rounds there uh you're able to see big matches on outside sort of courts and if you look at dignity health sports park and all the fields they have um it certainly seems like you'd be able to put something together i would imagine that uh the just the, the in terms of the manpower that would be needed to execute all that it would be a large uh a large ask uh security wise it would be a large ask there's a lot of things but um you know you might be able to drive it like the spring training which is it's an actual thing that people just go to arizona in spring training because you know you can go watch you know 17 baseball games well could well, you could you do the same thing in southern california well what do they have at the uh, stub of not you know or dignity health sports park not counting the main stadium i think there's something like seven full-size soccer fields if eight maybe if you include the track stadium and we know okay who's been here we know color you just mentioned the games that are coming up colorado yep. vancouver chicago um toronto's been here dallas new york city fc's been here um seattle trained out at long beach state uh, and then other teams that have come through the Canadian national team's been here. They played a couple of games. Iceland came here this winter. Right. Uh, Penarol came and played at LAFC and played Seattle. 
Um, you know, it, Costa Rica just came, played the U.S. The U.S. national team was here. They needed some scrimmages. Um, it, it, you know, there's a lot of action here, and it, it seems like, yeah, guys hook up, teams hook up, but it just seems like it's all kind of piecemeal. Like, the, the guys run into each other at the airport. What are you doing here? <laughs> you know, what yeah. if this was organized a little bit better for yeah. the fans and for the teams? Yeah, it, it might make some sense. I'm Also, it's kind of selfish of us to assume that they would just pick our backyard where we're at, Kevin. So that way it would make it easier for us, but... Um, well, but it does make sense because the facilities are here. Absolutely. Uh, the, the the teams come through. I mean, Penarol Pen is not going to Tucson. And right. Iceland didn't go to Tucson. Right, right. Um, and, you know, so and then the national team draws those teams because they're going to play at, at uh, you know, Dignity Health Sports Park. They had the friendly there. They generally end their January camp here. So I, I don't know. It just seems to make a lot of sense. Yeah. And it, and you have the USL teams, you know, San Diego Loyals are training now. Orange Orange County is training. Las yep. Vegas Lights are training. Um, those are games that could be played. Yeah. I mean, why, hey, you know, they uh, in, in Southern California, I think we've we've been known for our large youth soccer tournaments. Why not just have a large pro soccer tournament? And it doesn't even have to be a tournament. It's just a place where everybody is so that way you could scrimmage each other and get ready. And hopefully you could share the costs and defray those costs, um, you know, between the teams if you're all in one spot like that. That was the whole idea. It was just something I was kicking around. You know how it is. You have a great idea and then people will come and figure out how to make you feel horrible about it. So I'm sure uh, give it 10 minutes and somebody will tell me why I'm an idiot. Um, all right, so that's what we have coming up. Uh, the LA Galaxy, again, February 15th, have the scrimmage against Toronto FC at 3 p.m., and then Saturday, February 22nd, our live show day at 2 p.m., uh, the Galaxy kickoff against Chicago Fire at 3 p.m. Uh, still, I think that's about it, Kevin, in terms of stuff we wanted to cover. Um, I'm trying to think. that You know, the scrimmage today was the first time I've been able to watch this team actually play and line up kind of in the way that they were supposed to. If you even saw the training uh, that they had, the open training on Saturday night, there was not much you could glean from that. That was just a, an open training and a, lots of mixed lineups in there in terms of what you were trying to see. So if you saw this, and I don't know if there's a complete replay available. I don't know if the Galaxy archived it, but I know there's some highlights from this, and you'll get to see it. Uh, you get to see Pavone's awesome ball control uh, whenever he brings down a direct pass from Sebastian Legette, who went over the top. Great vision by Legette. Uh, good takedown by by Pavone. Uh, you get to see Ethan Zubak's good finish between two defenders. Again, elevation, correct height, being in the right place at the right time. Good cross from Pavone. Um, somebody said that they're pretty sure that Pavone is going to be the MVP of Major League Soccer this year. Uh, if he, pl you know, again, preseason. So don't draw too much. I once said Charlie Rugg was going to be uh, Rookie of the Year, and we'll bring that up as many times as we need to to sort of drive home my point that you don't really know what you're getting. Uh, right now in the preseason. But what you are seeing is a Christian Pavone who is very comfortable. And if you read Larry's article on Christian Pavone, it talks about how comfortable he is here in L.A. and how he's ready to be better than he was last year. And so far in preseason, from the 60 minutes we were able to see him play, he is better than what he was going to be last year. I mean, he just seems to be attacking, taking people on, having that success, finding that space, not being afraid to take over things. Uh, the big deal will be whether or not the LA Galaxy rely on him too much, and I think that's where Chicharito comes in, uh, able to sort of split up that reliance. Um, and if those two can get on the same page along with Katai, I think the LA Galaxy are going to score a lot of goals, which is something that was probably a question mark whenever Zlatan Ibrahimovic left. But uh, obviously, it's preseason, Kevin. And like we said on Thursday, and we'll say it again, you don't know if something matters in the preseason until about three quarters of the way through the season so you can look back and see those signs and sometimes stuff that you thought would matter in the preseason doesn't matter at all so uh it, it's one of those you just sort of take it take it for what it is look at it sort of you know absorb it a little bit and then you can uh, you can go forward from there by the way speaking of he who is no longer here um ibra had a goal and an assist in the milan derby this weekend although ac milan lost and that's the first loss that they've had in five games since he went over there. Uh, one thing I, I wanted to mention before we go is a lot of people have been asking me, what's the deal with, with Chicharito's visa? Why, why wasn't this done ahead of time? Why did this become an issue once he got here? Well, my understanding is it, it's, it's pretty simple. My understanding is you can't apply for a work visa in the United States, which is what he's trying to get until you have a job in the United States. That means the galaxy can negotiate contracts as long as they want, but until that contract's signed, Chicharito does not have a job with a U.S. company, so therefore he cannot apply for a visa. At least that's my understanding. So then once he gets that, yes, the Galaxy have ways to expedite it, and they have high-powered lawyers and, and whatever else, and they've done this t uh, a lot of times. Their administration, uh, you know, there's a, a there's a network uh, working with other teams to get this stuff done. So it's much easier for him to get that done than, 
you know, if you or I had hired someone uh, that needed a visa. But still, there is a process, and he had to go back to his home country. Um, Dennis talked today, and this was the problem last year with Polenta and some others. You just don't show up at, at the consulate and say, I want a visa. There right. has to be an appointment made. Um, you know, you can't, maybe they wanted him to go to Tijuana. Well, there's no appointments there. How about if I go to Guadalajara? That's where I live. No, no appointments there. I, I believe he went to Mexico city. I don't know that, but you need to wait for a U.S. embassy or consulate to have an appointment available. Then you need to go there, present yourself in person. The paperwork has to be in order. It all has to be done. And whatever side of the political spectrum, spectrum you're on, there is no doubt that this process has been made much more difficult under the Trump administration right. because every T is being crossed and every I is being dotted and baseball teams, the basketball teams, they're all having the same problem. So that's, that's the, the issue with, with Chicharito. It wasn't anything the galaxy did wrong. They, they, they didn't wait too long. It's just the process takes that. And that's another reason why Insua was late into camp after they signed him the decision was made he should stay where he is and take care of his visa before he comes to the United States, which he did. So he showed up. My understanding was he showed up legally ready to work. Yep. It just took him a couple of weeks to get here. Yep. That's all right. That seems to all be the thing. Yeah. It's, it's nothing that's, uh, that I, you know, at least not that I can tell that the galaxy have done anything wrong. It's just the, the, the current political climate, how long it takes to get these things done, uh, seems to have been expanded a little bit. And, um, like you said, having to go back outside the country and then come back in is always one of those things that you look at. So Chicharito uh, having to do that down in Mexico, and like I said, they, I think they're say, and I, I've been, I, I, I am talking to somebody who who might know this, uh, but there's a good chance that Chicharito, you know, makes it back by even by Monday night as we're recording this. He could already be back. Everything could be fine, or it's going to be you know Tuesday and then he comes back on Wednesday and he's there for training. But very fairly soon, and trust me, the LA Galaxy can't wait for this to happen. You're going to see. Uh, Javier Hernandez, Chicharito, right there, uh, get in in training, and they're going to put out a whole bunch of pictures of him training with the team. Um, well, and, and a couple other things about that is okay. So why did Chicharito come? Why didn't he stay in Spain or go straight to Mexico, take care of his visa? Insua did that. Well, there's a big difference between the public relations and marketing oomph that you get from Chicharito. They wanted to have him in market so they could do that marketing, so they could do all those interviews, so they could take all those pictures. It was much more important to have Chicharito in market, even if it meant his visa was delayed a week to 10 days. Um, that helped the club much more. And so I did not have that those issues. So he was able to take care of business first and then show up. And, and that definitely, I think, was a factor. Um, it, you look at Chicharito, uh, and it, you can kind of look at this from a lot, number of different angles. Hey, he's coming in the middle of a season in Sevilla. They had already, you know, they're through the, halfway through their season. So he's fit. Yes, he's been in training, but he hasn't played right. regularly since October. So he's not in game fitness. I don't know how that how the Galaxy look at that. Yes, he's kind of fit, but yet he's not game fit. But also the bigger issue, he doesn't have chemistry. He's going to be the target forward. He's going to have to know he and, and, and Pavone and Katai and those guys are going to have – to get uh, on the same page. And I was talking to some other players coming back from national teams, Walker Zimmerman being one. And he talked about, you know, you look at your new teammates and it's like, Oh, this guy is going to make runs. I'm going to get him the ball. Well, how fast does he run? Does right. he like the ball on the right foot or the left foot? Does he like it high or low? Does he want it bouncing or on the ground? Those are things that seem, uh, you know, innocuous and not important, but they're absolutely vital. And the only way to figure that out is to train with a guy. Yeah, you got to see. I mean, you know, it's even a matter of like how guys curve their runs and where they like the ball. I mean, Zlatan certainly was vocal about telling you where he liked the ball and how to do it and how to get it to him. And he would yell at you if you didn't. Uh, but for most guys who are, I would say, quote unquote, normal, um, you know, it takes a little while of, of figuring out which direction they like to go. Whenever they fake inside, are you ready to actually put the ball outside or or are you also going to bite on the fake and all of a sudden you pass it and it goes to nobody? Um, all those things happen in the game and it's the reason why uh, they train so much. Uh, there's a reason why they continue to uh, you know, just put in the minutes. And so whenever Chicharito comes in and officially gets to play and gets to uh, gets to partner with these guys to build that chemistry, um, they, they'll they be able to do that. So If the Galaxy are smart, and I believe they're smart, a lot of these guys, especially Pavone and Katai, are probably looking at a lot of tape, watching Chicharito's greatest moments to see – where he likes the ball, how he likes the ball, how he's most successful. And and so I think they're probably going to be a little bit ahead when he does get on the field. It's not going to be like, who is this guy? Uh, you know, they're, this is a, a veteran guy who played 10 years in Europe. They're going to have a little bit of a book on him already. Yeah, it seems that way. All right. Uh, let's see. I think that does it. Kevin, you good? I am. Okay, good. I'm glad. More or less. 
Yeah, well, I mean, you know, it's it's all a matter of degrees. Relatively speaking, yeah. Yes, absolutely. Uh, let's see. If you're looking for Mr. Kevin Baxter on Twitter, uh, you can find him at kbaxter11. And, of course, head on over to uh, latimes.com where you get all of Kevin's wonderful Southern California soccer coverage. So make sure you do that. Follow Kevin Baxter on Twitter. Uh, he'll be out there on our live show as well. All right. If you're looking for me on Twitter, it's at Jay Guessman, J-G-U-E-S-M-A-N. And, of course, at Galaxy Podcast. Uh, head on over to cornerofthegalaxy.com. Our videos, our podcasts, all of our written articles. And Larry Morgan has been writing like crazy. So check out all of Larry's great coverage there of the LA Galaxy. You're not going to want to miss it. All right. I think that about does it. We have a live show coming up on Thursday. I will tell you who my co-host will be. Eric out again. So... Uh, we'll have to uh, roll the wheel of co-hosts and see who makes it in. Uh, for Mr. Kevin the Panda Baxter, I'm Josh Gessman, and you've been listening to Corner of the Galaxy from the Box on cornerofthegalaxy.com. Have a great one, everybody. You've been listening to the Corner of the Galaxy podcast on cornerofthegalaxy.com. You can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at Galaxy Podcast, and be sure to check out and subscribe to iTunes, Stitcher, and Facebook by searching for Corner of the Galaxy. Fans, we thank you for listening, and we ask that you be kind and courteous to your neighbors as you leave the podcast. We thank you for joining us and look forward to seeing you again. Until then, I'm Michael Araujo, and on behalf of the entire Corner of the Galaxy crew, goodbye, everybody.